the president tests positive. President Donald Trump announces he and the first lady have been diagnosed with the coronavirus. We have team coverage, including from the White House, plus reaction from lawmakers on Capitol Hill. And path to priesthood. A newly ordained deacon tells us about his journey from Oregon to Rome. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, October 2nd, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania Trump both test positive for COVID-19. The Trump campaign has announced that all events with the president are now being postponed or moved online. White House correspondent Owen Jensen begins our team coverage tonight. The coronavirus infects one of the most powerful leaders in the world. President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania Trump both test positive. The first couple now isolating in the private residence. The president tweeted overnight, we will begin our quarantine and recovery process immediately, adding, we will get through this together. They remain in good spirits. Uh, uh, the president does have mild symptoms. And as, uh, as we look to try to uh, make sure that not only his health and safety and welfare is good, we continue to look at that for all of the American people. The president's doctor confirmed the diagnosis overnight, writing, I expect the president to continue carrying out his duties without disruption while recovering. Across the globe, Donald Trump and his Frau Melania, world leaders send their best wishes. It's not clear how the Trumps caught the virus, but on Wednesday night, the president was on his way back from a rally in Minnesota on Air Force One. With him was Hope Hicks, one of his closest aides. She fell ill and later tested positive for coronavirus. Hope Hicks earlier attended this week's presidential debate, standing in the same room with Joe Biden. He tweeted out today, Jill and I send our thoughts to President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump for a swift recovery. We will continue to pray for the health and safety of the president and his family. Biden and his wife have tested negative for the virus. Despite Hope Hicks's test results, President Trump still attended a fundraiser in New Jersey yesterday, but canceled today's trip to Florida. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows reassured Americans. The American people uh, can rest assured that uh, we have a president that uh, is not only on the job, will remain on the job, and uh, I'm optimistic that uh, he'll have a very quick and speedy recovery. Vice President Mike Pence and Second Lady Karen Pence tested negative for COVID-19 this morning. Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. A multiple White House staffers have tested positive for the virus this year. They include Vice President Mike Pence's press secretary, Katie Miller, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, and one of the president's personal valets. Also, the Republican National Committee confirmed today that Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel learned that she had tested positive Wednesday afternoon. She has been at her home in Michigan since last Saturday and did not attend the debate. And the University of Notre Dame President Father John Jenkins has tested positive for COVID-19 as well. He attended the Supreme Court announcement last Saturday at the White House and apologized earlier this week for not wearing a mask during the ceremony. He had received a negative test result while at the White House. In a statement to students, Father Jenkins says his symptoms are mild. And on Capitol Hill, Senator Mike Lee announces that he also tested positive for COVID-19. The news comes as lawmakers react to the president's diagnosis. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales continues our coverage. I don't have any doubt that things would have played out exactly the same way. Speaking in yesterday's Judiciary Committee meeting, Senator Mike Lee says that he was experiencing symptoms consistent with longtime allergies and was tested for COVID-19. Today, he announced, quote, Yesterday's test came back positive. He says he will isolate for the next 10 days and adds, quote, I will be back to work in time to join my Judiciary Committee colleagues in advancing the Supreme Court nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Senate Democrats Chuck Schumer and Dianne Feinstein are calling on Republicans to postpone Barrett's confirmation hearing. But today, Senator Lindsey Graham, chairman of the Judiciary, assured the president Barrett's confirmation hearing will go on as planned. The 
president was in good spirits. The first thing he asked me, Terry, how's the hearings going? I said, we're on track. We're going to start October the 12th. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she is praying for President Trump's recovery. Very sad to pray for him and the First Lady and hope that Also on the Hill today, HHS Secretary Alex Azar. He cautioned lawmakers against doubting the reliability of a vaccine when it's released. But anybody who works to undermine confidence in the FDA's approval process or makes unfounded allegations that somehow politics will warp science, data-driven processes, undermines public confidence in an eventual vaccine, those vaccines can save lives. A COVID-19 vaccine is yet to be approved and released. Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Uh, last night before the president's diagnosis, he and Democratic candidate Joe Biden both spoke at a dinner in New York that raises millions of dollars for Catholic charities. At the virtual event, the president noted his efforts to help the faithful. A nation is strong because of Catholics and, frankly, people of all faiths. That is why, as president, one of my top priorities is to defend religious liberty and the cherished role of faith and faith-based organizations in our national life. President Trump also said that he will not accept any attacks on the Catholic faith of Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett. Democratic candidate Joe Biden used his remarks to discuss how his faith has guided his public life. And throughout my life in public service, I've been guided by the tenets of Catholic social doctrine that cuts across all confessional faiths. What you do to the least among us, you do unto me. The former vice president also described how his Catholic faith helped him through several personal losses. Joining me now to take a closer look at last night's remarks is Edward Condon, D.C. Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency and a canon lawyer. Ed, thanks for joining us. Always good to see you. So the speeches last night were definitely different in nature. Let's begin with President Trump. He used the opportunity to tout the administration's accomplishments and priorities among them protecting the unborn, that pro-life record certainly resonates deeply with the faithful. Well, that's right, Tracy. Um, president Trump has definitely lent heavily on his pro-life credentials. He was, of course, the first sitting president to address the March for Life. Um, and really, the, the abortion has taken, I think, a more prominent role in this presidential campaign and is being acknowledged, perhaps, by either of the two candidates, at least so far, or in their first debate together earlier this week. Nevertheless, it's a topmost issue for voters. Um, both sides really, I think, quite far apart on that, and it's really a black or white issue, both for the candidates and for many voters. And uh, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, he also gave a, he gave a personal reflection of his Catholic faith and its importance. What stood out to you from his remarks? Well, I think one of the things that stood out to me most during Vice President Biden's remarks was actually before he took the microphone. He was introduced, and um, the person who introduced him said that Al Smith, who, for whom this dinner is obviously named the first Catholic to get nominated for president by one of the two parties, would have been proud to see Joe Biden become president. Uh, I don't know how true that is. I, I can't speak to to, the, to Al Smith's ghost, as it were. But I think it's, it raises a wider issue that both Vice President Biden and President Trump uh, have areas of their policy and their, what they would like to see um, take place where they elected that are very far distant from Catholic teaching, whether it's on, for example, abortion or the death penalty. And, and I think this really, the entire Al Smith dinner, uh, or not dinner, as it were, since it was a virtual event, points to the fact that there's um, a great deal of invocation of Catholicism and an appeal to Catholic voters on both campaigns here, but still a great distance by both candidates from actually the fullness of the church's teaching. Yeah, and one of the things that both of the men did was directly appeal to Catholic voters. We know from our EWTN News Real Clear Opinion research polling, which was conducted before the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that the frequency of mass attendance correlates closely with which major candidate a Catholic supports. How significant do you think that will be as we get closer to the election? Well, there's no question that... Um the, the amount to, um, one attends church definitely is a strong predictor of not only one's social values but also one's vote. And certainly regular mass attendees seem to be skewing more in favor of the president. And I think that's something that's likely to hold. It's remained relatively steady over the president's first term. But of course, this has been a campaign of surprises. I, I think if anyone had been told only a few months ago that the Al Smith dinner would be taking place online, and certainly it was a humorless event compared to previous years, people would have struggled to understand that. So this has been, an, this has been a race of surprises, and I think we probably haven't seen the end of them yet. 
Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and before we let you go, though, I do quickly want to get your take on the big news of the day, which, of course, is President Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis. Well wishes for him and the First Lady coming from leaders all over the world, as well as his Democratic rival, Joe Biden. Let's talk about that. Absolutely. I mean, it's... <laughs> It's a deeply tragic and human um, and deeply humanizing event uh, whenever anyone falls ill, particularly with this pandemic that, that we've been in the midst of. And, you know, how this will play out as a political issue is certainly not yet sure. Um, but as you say, it's, it's a moment when um, both from political opponents and from world leaders, the president and first lady on the receiving end of a number of well wishes and certainly from all of us here, I'm sure, too. Uh, of course, this is just the latest twist in a in a long um, running series of unexpected events. A Supreme Court vacancy, a surprising tone in a debate, and now, of course, this diagnosis for the president. Uh, the real unknown, of course, is the recovery time for the president and also those those around him who've been diagnosed subsequently. I mean, you know, we're, we've talked a lot uh, in recent days about the Senate confirmations hearings into Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, remains to be seen how that confirmation schedule could be affected by members of the Judiciary Committee testing positive. So really, there are a lot of unknowns around here. This This is a very unsettled race. Absolutely. Well, Ed, we really do appreciate your time and you coming on and speaking with us today. Edward Conan, D.C. Bureau Chief for Catholic News Agency. Thanks again, Ed. Always a pleasure, Tracy. Coming up, why a pro-life proposal named for the late Representative Henry Hyde faces an uncertain future. This week marks the 44th anniversary of the Hyde Amendment, the federal policy prohibiting federal funding of elective abortions except in cases of rape, incest, and when the life of the mother is at stake. However, the future of this pro-life measure is uncertain, as House Democrats have signaled it will be excluded from spending bills next year if they retain the majority. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about the Hyde Amendment and its future is Michael New, associate scholar at the Charlotte Lozier Institute and visiting assistant professor at the Catholic University of America. We also have Katie Glenn, Government Affairs Council for Americans United for Life. Welcome to you both and thank you so much for coming on the show. Michael, I want to start with you. Can you talk about the impact this policy has had as well as the lives that have been saved by the Hyde Amendment? Sure. Uh, when it comes to uh, public policy on sanctity of life issues, there's usually a lot of disagreement. Uh, Pro-life researchers often say one thing. Researchers who support abortion often say something else. When it comes to the issue of taxpayer funding for elective abortions, which is what the Hyde Amendment limits, there's actually a lot of consensus. Pretty much everyone who's looked at this issue agrees. You put limits on the ability of the federal government to pay for abortion, abortion numbers go down. Uh, the Guttmacher Institute which up until 2007 was Planned Parenthood's research arm. They did a comprehensive literature review back in 2009. They looked at studies in economics, political science, public health. They found an overwhelming number of studies found that the Hyde Amendment has saved lives. The uh, Center for Reproductive Rights did an analysis in 2010. They found that the Hyde Amendment had saved over 1 million lives since 1976. And I did a study for the Charlotte Lozier Institute. It was first published in 2016. It was updated in 2020. My calculations indicate that the Hyde Amendment has saved over 2.4 million lives since 1976. So, you know, don't let anyone tell you that pro-life political involvement has been for naught. There are 2.4 million people walking around today who owe their lives to the Hyde Amendment. Yeah. Katie, this question is for you. From a government policy perspective, how important is the Hyde Amendment? And also, what message does it send? And also another thing, as you know, there are critics who say it discriminates against women of color and those of lower economic means. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I think our starting point in any conversation of the Hyde Amendment needs to be its history. 44 years ago, the first time it was added to our law, over 100 Democrats supported this. Every single year that he was in the Senate, Vice President Joe Biden supported the Hyde Amendment. So this has gone from being something that was bipartisan, non-controversial, something all Americans generally agree on, to now being something that Nancy Pelosi says she will fight tooth and nail to keep out of budget. And what's happening here is a conversation about whether our laws affirm life or end life, whether we think it's appropriate for federal taxpayer money to be used to destroy life, or whether we should be supporting women and supporting families. And that's what's at stake here. Is our government going to kill babies and hurt families, or are we going to support families? 
Michael, I want to go back to you on this question. What exactly does polling show about public opinion on taxpayer-funded abortions? Sure. There's a very strong body of polling data and survey data out there, which shows that most Americans reject the idea that taxpayers should fund for elective abortions. Uh, I have seen over about seven polls that have been taken since 2016. These are polls conducted by different survey research firms. They are polls that have used different wording. And they have clearly found that, uh, I guess I would say that all seven found that pluralities of Americans oppose the idea of taxpayer funding for elective abortions. And six of the seven found that majorities oppose the idea of taxpayer funding for elective abortions. So the Hyde Amendment is not only good policy, it's good politics, it enjoys very broad public support. And Katie, I want to pose this last question to you. Uh, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden has said that he no longer supports the Hyde Amendment after doing so for many decades. President Trump, on the other hand, does support it. What do we know about the efforts on Capitol Hill to do away with the Hyde Amendment? Well, this year, even we've seen um, the Hyde Amendment come into play with the coronavirus funding. Uh, multiple times this year, Nancy Pelosi has said that she wants to pull Hyde Amendment protections out of the coronavirus bill. She said that a budget next year would not include it. And so I think, you know, we need to take this seriously. When Nancy Pelosi says she'll put forth a budget that does not include Hyde, that requires federal taxpayer money to be spent on elective abortions, and Joe Biden says that if he were president, he would sign that, we need to take them at their word. Well, Katie, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Katie Glenn, Michael New, thank you both for talking with us today. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Up next, a seminarian continues his journey to the priesthood during the coronavirus pandemic. Eight men were ordained as deacons yesterday in Rome, and because of the coronavirus pandemic, the ceremony looked a little different. The service is normally open to more than 1,000 people. However, this year, because of the coronavirus pandemic, attendance was limited to only a few hundred. Ordination to the diaconate marks the last stage in seminary formation. The next is ordination to the priesthood. And Dustin Bussey, one of the eight newly ordained deacons, joins us now from Rome. Deacon Bussey, great to have you on the show. So tell us, what was the ordination like yesterday? Were family members able to attend? Thank you, Tracy. It's really a pleasure to be on your show this evening. The ordination yesterday was really quite a wonderful experience. It was a culmination of many years of, of preparation and discernment, and to, to be together with, with all the faculty and my friends, my brothers in formation, it was really just a wonderful experience. Unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic that we're going through right now, so many family members and friends and pilgrims from our home states were not able to join us uh, yesterday, but I was fortunate to have my mother come. She, uh, she found her way into Europe, and so, as a mother, only a mother could. <laughs> That's wonderful. You mentioned COVID. Uh, speaking of COVID, how different was the service because of that? Yeah, this year was a lot different than what I've experienced in years past. In the past, I've had the opportunity to serve at this ordination mass at St. Peter's. And unfortunately, due to this global pandemic, uh, there were just many precautions that had to be taken this year. As I mentioned before, so many visitors who would typically come to what is generally the largest liturgy that our college holds in the year uh, was limited in number. From last year, where we may have had as many as 1,500 people, uh, guests and attendants and priests and, and just many people here to, to celebrate with us and to pray with us on the, on the glorious day of ordination, uh, this year we were limited to, to under 200 guests. And it, so largely it was only members within our seminary community and then just a few guests that happened to, to be in country that could, could attend. I know that you're originally from Oregon, but you're in your third year of studying theology in Rome. When exactly did you first know that you had a vocation to the priesthood? Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, I think you could say, like 
many of the uh, disciples or apostles in the gospel passages, well, we see that the Lord does not always call every man or woman to follow him at the same time. And for me, that calling from the Lord came to me not until I was later in life, until I was in my 30s. What do you think, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge today facing young men in following the vocation? I think the largest problem that we have today in today's uh, culture is just the, the amount of noise that goes on in our daily lives. There are so many wonderful resources that we have online, uh, on TV, on our various technological devices, in the car, wherever we're at. We can stay plugged in and tuned into many wonderful things, but then also some things that don't necessarily communicate the Lord's message to us. And at the same time, all of these things, whether good or bad, they just create a lot of noise in our lives. And I think to really hear the Lord's call in our heart, it takes time with the Lord, whether it's in the reading of his sacred scripture, his word, or whether it's in front of him in the Blessed Sacrament, uh, praising him at the various liturgies that your local church might have, any of the number of these ways in which we can encounter the Lord in our lives. Um, these are the ways in which we can hear that call. And until uh, men take that opportunity to pull away a little bit from the distractions that we have, it's going to be difficult for, for them to, to really hear. Yeah, well, we thank you for answering that call, and thank you for joining us today, Dustin Bussey, newly ordained deacon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We leave you tonight with the Pope's visit with the new recruits to the Swiss Guard, a swearing-in ceremony of the 38 new guards will take place this weekend after being delayed due to COVID-19. Good night, and God bless. cioè a Cristo, che vi chiama ad essere uomini e cristiani protagonisti della vostra esistenza.